Welcome to the Registry Insider. I'm Bill Seifert, CEO and Executive Director of the National Registry of ENTs. And we're filming today from Eastern Kentucky University. And joining me for conversation today is Dr. Bill Young. He's Program Director here at EKU. He's also uh, an MC board member, as well as a site visitor for COA MSP, as well as Mr. Brian Erickson. He's Program Director from Tarrant County College in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he's the former president of NEMC as well as a uh, COA site visitor. And finally, Dr. Paul Rosenberger. He's a uh, manager of a content team at the National Red Studio EMTs. And gentlemen, thank you for joining me for our conversation today. Well, thank you thank for you. having us. Yeah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about this thing called clinical judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, the, reg the National Registry, we launched our exam on July 1. Um, quite happy about it, but there's still some perhaps some uncertainty or ambiguity as to what clinical judgment is and certainly why we at the National Register are assessing it. So, Paul, if you wouldn't mind, give us a high level overview as to what is clinical judgment, why we're assessing it and, and what importance it has as it relates to the EMS community. Yeah, so clinical judgment um, is really the collection of two things. It is um, clinical reasoning that we use and then the decision making that we go because of that reasoning. And so combined together, um, that is clinical judgment. Um, the model proposes six steps in that, and that's to recognize cues, to analyze cues, to come up with a hypothesis, to generate solutions, to take an action, and then ultimately to evaluate those actions. And so that's really the model um, that is out there in um, some academic journals for people to read and brush up on. But uh, the reason why it's important is because in 2019, the EMS community told us that um, paramedics do use clinical judgment, leadership, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. communication. And so we captured that in that practice analysis, and that has rolled out to the AMT and paramedic examinations. Good, good. So that's kind of high level what it is, good overview, as well as a, um, a description as to the why, as it came in our, in our practice analysis in 2019 and then as amended in 2021. So Bill and Brian, from educators' perspective, what what's the significance as far as impact for this in a classroom as it relates to clinical judgment? Is there anything massive changing in your classrooms? Yeah, yeah. not really. It's not changing in my classroom very much uh, with 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 our faculty that we have here. In the fact that we're a firm believer in what you learn in the classroom is what you're going to need to implement out on the streets. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that that, that we do and, and we're, we're really proud of is that we've always tried to teach our students to think. One of the things that my students hear from me on a regular basis is that you're going to be on the side of the road at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're going to lose your patient and nothing that you learned in class is presenting the way that you learned in class. Mm -hmm. And nothing that you do is working for your patient you still have to take care of that patient. Now, what are you going to do? So if we're able to take those steps that Dr. Rosenberger shared with us just a little bit ago, now they can come up with a plan of still providing good, high-quality care for that patient, even though they're not getting all of the data back, simply because, again, a well-known statement is that the patient hasn't read the book. And so in order to do that, you've got to be able to think through curveballs that patients throw at us simply because of pathophysiology. Right. Cookbook medicine is gone. It's been gone for a long time. Uh, we no longer uh, insert uh, tab A into slot B, uh, but we have to go through this whole process of being able to think critically as well as clinically mm -hmm. and come up with a solution for our patients. Right. I would, I would, you know, also argue that really nothing fundamentally changes in the classroom, right? <laughs> if you are teaching your students to the end point of, you know, what your goal, what's the goal, define the goal of what a student is. What, what is the end goal? It's a competent entry level mm -hmm. paramedic or AEMT. There's somebody that's prepared to go out and do the job at the entry level. So we're not teaching them to think, teaching them to analyze, teaching them to take the clues that they need to, to make the right decisions. So one of the arguments that my students say, well, I'm not a doctor, I don't diagnose. I said, well, if you're not going to make a diagnosis, you probably need to get out of my classroom mm -hmm. because how are you going to make a treatment decision if you can't diagnose the condition? If you pulled out that abuterol to give to that patient because you recognize bronchoconstriction secondary to their asthma, you just diagnosed them with a reactive airway disease, didn't you? And they're like, 
Oh, yeah, I think that's right. So I think for a lot of programs across the country, this new test is really not that different than what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. We are just really measuring it in a little bit different way. And it, it, to me, it's a, it's a kind of a nice natural evolution of our profession as well. So now we're actually showing that, hey, these aren't just, you know, when they, the, the, the dreaded term ambulance drivers, right? These are healthcare professionals who have to be able to think critically take care of patients and make key decisions. And if we're not preparing them as educators, they're not going to be able to be successful. Right. And I think too, a lot of people focus so much on the test, right? So what's on the test? What's on the test? What's on the test? That's the wrong focus in the classroom. The focus in the classroom should be what do my students need to be successful? What do my students need to be competent professionals? Successful what as my, clinicians. Clinicians, exactly. Not on the exam. Yeah. Not if the exam. If they're going to be good clinicians, they'll yeah, be okay. Absolutely. And I tell my students all the time, I do not care about the national registry exam. And they look at you like, well, I don't. If I do my job, you're going to pass that exam. I, I don't have to worry about the exam. The exam is just a step to validate everything you went through in my program. So, yeah, you know, the, people get all worked up over the exam like it's some kind of major milestone. And it really is, you know, it's a it's a base. It's a baseline. Right. It's just all it is is validate. OK, you've got your education. You're ready to go. And that we function. They can function at the, a safe effective entry level, entry yeah. level competent. And level. this is where people get really, I think, really bent sometimes, right? Is when you tell them the National Registry is entry level assessment. Is it? We're assessing the baseline entry level, what it takes to enter the profession. We're not testing a 50 year medic who's doing critical care transfers and does all kinds of things with different things. That's a whole different process. Mm -hmm. We are preparing these, these, I call them kids because I'm old, but I prepare my kids, my students to enter the profession as mm -hmm. competent care giver providers. And then, you know, there's so much more now to what EMS was before, you know, when, I mean, we went in, it was all the ambulance, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now like I got students that go straight to the hospital. They'll never go work in an ambulance. They're right. going to go work in an emergency department somewhere. I have to prepare students to be able to take care of a patient wherever they find them. So yeah, it's a good point. So clinical judgment, obviously, you know, from our practice analysis, going back to that, it came up to a little, about one third of the examinations can be dedicated to that on AMT and over a third, all just shy of 40% for, for paramedics. So it's, it's a critical, it's a mm -hmm. critical piece. So from kind of rehashing a little bit of what we said, but from an educator's perspective, is there any secret sauce to, to preparing your students? So we talked about if you, if you teach them how to mm -hmm. if you teach the, the kids or students or um, yeah, students to, to function in the field, they're going to be fine with the exam. Any secret sauce you have is to both. I think the successful. secret sauce is a combination of some very important documents that you must be familiar with. So obviously the national education standards, yeah, because the education standards dictate, you know, what the education program needs to contain. You need to look at the national scope of practice because the scope of practice defines the floor for what mm -hmm. a paramedic or an AEMT or an EMT needs to do. You need to look at the National Registry Practice Analysis. And I don't know a lot of educators don't pay attention to that practice analysis, but that practice analysis is huge because it actually looks at what are our kids doing? What are these medics going to be doing? What are the job sets, skills they need to have? And if you're not addressing the practice analysis, the scope of practice, and the national education standards, then you're going to have a hard time preparing students mm -hmm. to be successful on the registry. And then one other document that I like is the NIMSIMSO Clinical Treatment Guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. And people go, oh my God, it's this really thick, crazy book. Well, the thing about the NIMSIMSO Clinical Treatment Guidelines is that can give you a foundation of what's kind of going on nationally, right? Mm -hmm. You must teach your students to be able to perform anywhere. They're not, I'm not teaching a Fort Worth paramedic. Yes, my paramedics are going to go to work in Fort Worth, but I'm teaching a paramedic to go work anywhere. My paramedics are going to take a national exam that is based off national standards. So for me, the secret sauce is just that. It's the national process. One other document or reference that I would point people to is the Pre-Hospital Guidelines Consortium. Yes. Oh, Prehospitalguidelines.org yeah, yeah, yeah. for yep. sure. Yeah, that's a yeah. very resource. And we're going to have in 2024 um, another updated uh, listing, systematic review and, and reading list too. So that's something that reader, ed educators can go to. So Bill, how about you? Any additional so, so for me, secrets? what... One of the things I, I stress to students and anybody else that will listen is, number one, we want to educate. And I like the word educate rather than train. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to educate our, our students to be good clinicians. But they're not going to do that unless they pass their licensing exams. And I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that those are two mutually exclusive things. If I do, much like Brian said, if I educate my students to become good critical 
clinical thinkers in the class, then when they get ready to sit for the registry exam, they'll do fine. And one of the things I, I want to stress is that in many situations with this, quote, new exam, it's not really new for us as educators because the content that the exam covers is the same content that we've been teaching for a number of years mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. we worked on the, the educational guidelines. And, and so I, I, I would like for educators to take a deep breath and to relax because we're not asking them to do a lot more work, but we are asking them as educators to learn to maybe structure some sure. of their exam questions just a little bit differently. Because every time we look at one of these exam question types, it assesses from another area. And, and so I think that's one of the things I'm most excited about in this particular sure. exam is now, rather than just simply sitting there and going through, you know, X number of multiple choice questions, now we will have a certain number of drag and drop, a certain number of, okay, select all that uh, apply or, or select, you know, the two or three that apply here. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, again, it, it's, it, it's really doesn't mean a lot. If you're doing the right thing in your class, right. now, if you're not doing the right thing, students are not going to do well. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to do well on the old exam either. Yeah. But the big thing is it's just an evolution in education in the fact, much like medicine, if we're teaching the same way we taught 10 years ago, yeah. we're doing something really bad. We're doing a disservice to the profession. Yeah, I think, can, I think. Can, I, can I chime into something? Please. Yeah. Um, you know, you said uh, we're already teaching this stuff. And the truth of it is, is what we're doing now is we're testing uh, the clinical judgment with scenarios. Right? Yes. And these scenarios mm -hmm. are everyday run of the mill calls. Correct. Yeah. A heart right. attack. Right. A stroke. And a it's trauma stuff bit, we're so doing already. A diabetic patient. I mean, it's it's stuff that if we went out and got an ambulance and we rode for 12 hours, we're going to see it. Yeah. yeah. One of these emergencies. That's right. Well, I think another part of it, you know, that people don't give, I think, pay enough attention to or maybe don't give enough credit to is the clinical education component of your program, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about clinical judgment, where the students get to actually practice that is in clinical, yes. right? So yes. we can do a lot of great stuff in the lab. We can simulate all kinds of awesome stuff. But until the student gets to take it to put it to a real patient application and apply, and it. It, and apply it, that's what's going to start to make a big difference. So when you look from a CoA perspective, and Bill and I are both site visitors, you know, when I go to a program as a site visitor and I see a very robust clinical program mm -hmm. where they're doing all kinds of ICUs and, you know, uh, even like things like um, a hospice. I mean, there's a program doing hospice care where students yeah. are doing hospice. Nursing yeah. home. Nursing, nursing home. Nursing Yeah. Uh, clinical. Uh, all these different places where the students get to go put it into practice, they have fantastic success rates. So don't underestimate the power of that clinical. Don't be like, well, I got to do 72 hours for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Well, 72, 80 hours of what? Of what course. are you doing? Right. Which is which is why the student minimum competencies document, both for paramedic and AEMT, mm -hmm. is so critical. And so Absolutely. Important. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the, the accreditation on the medic side, I know some people think accreditation is a bad word. It's not. No. The accreditation gives us some really valuable tools to help support the clinical judgment. If you would model some of the things you're doing on the medic side for accreditation across your program, all your disciplines, you would see the similar results in my opinion. So it's all about kind of making sure you're, you're, you're tracking and you're making sure they're giving us. And, and here in Kentucky, we've done something similar though with our, our EMT uh, level in the fact that we no longer have and have not had for a number of years, uh, a psychomotor exam mm -hmm. in the fact that we look to the educators to document their competency within that themselves. And again, now the board of EMS has set up its own SMCs for the EMT level. And as such, We've already implemented that, and it, 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 it's an adult education issue, not just an EMS issue. Correct. And this is, a, I think people need to realize in EMS education, too, that this is an education problem. And yes. I'm not even a problem. I don't want to say problem. Mm -hmm. This is just robust education. Mm -hmm. And you, you said training. I don't like the word train. We don't train. You train a dog, mm -hmm. right? People need to be educated. Yeah. People need to be equipped. People need to be able to be informed. People need the information to make the right choices, the right judgments. 
you know, I can train my dogs to sit, but I can't train my dog to think. Now, yeah, people yeah, argue that, maybe I could, but you yeah, know. the corollary to that, that Brian is is that I, you know, I, I, I tell students, and I'm a big dog person. <laughs> we train our dogs, but the dogs don't know why they're doing what they're doing that to the degree that oh, to, a get a would, yeah. to get a treat to get a treat yeah, or yeah. to play with a ball, <laughs> right? Yeah. Ver- versus the clinical judgment, right? Yes, they know the they why. Know they the understand why. the physiology, they know the, why. the they know pathophysiology. The why. Yeah, I'm reaching for this albuterol because I know that it's a beta two sympathomimetic. What? Oh, my, that's a big word. Well, yeah, I know that a beta two sympathomimetic is a bronchodilator, and it's going to open up my airway so I can get this patient and resolve the issue with the reactive airway disease. It's like what? All of a sudden, I understand what I'm doing. Yeah, and, and then I don't understand the pathophysiology and the the response from the from the pharmacology. They understand the bigger picture of the entire call. Yeah, yes, um, yes. Which is again, I think one of you said an evolution in EMS. So it definitely right. exciting times as it relates to EMS. I EMS think so. education. Oh, I think so. I think this is. Uh, you know, obviously with any change, you know, people always change is hard. Mm-hmm. It's different. It's not what we've done, you know, but I think as this rolls and we see more and more students in this process, I don't think, I don't see a big impact to, to pass rates or a big impact to, well, I was going to say, you know, whenever the nursing profession um, introduced clinical judgment, as well as a couple other in allied health introduced it, their pass rates went up. So um, we're not sure if it's going to go you know, up per se, but we have been monitoring these, Paul, since October of 2022. Yeah. So these items are out there. And, and anecdotally, the students that I speak to, the program directors who have students, because yeah. they've been exposed to them, the students love them and they're performing pretty well. They're very reliable. We know the statistical performance on them. That reminds me, Paul, where can educators go to find out more about, A, about clinical judgment or B, about these types of items that are on the exam? So we've worked really hard at National Registry to, um, put all this content and these tools out on our website. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to Mm www.nremt.org, you'll land on our homepage. And if you scroll down just a little bit, there's a lot of content. The link that's most helpful is the one that says about the examination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you go to that link, it'll take you to all this information where there's a PDF that's downloadable that talks about what is clinical judgment and what are those steps and it describes those. Um, there are um, a tutorial video that also talks about uh, clinical judgment, but I think the best tools that are out there are the um, the links that take them to fifteen AMT items, free items, free, free items, free items. Yeah. and fifteen paramedic items, and it gives that candidate and those educators and those state officials that opportunity to actually experience a test very similar to what they're going to see mm-hmm. when they go to Pearson. The look, the look and feel of the Pearson yeah. test. Yeah. Tutorials, um, directions, and then they the items actually launch. And uh, they get to experience the, the five existing domains, but then they get to experience that scenario that has about nine or ten items associated mm-hmm. with it that it, measures clinical judgment, leadership, and communication. You know, Paul, I was, do, I was doing a, a registry test prep for, a, for a, a, a college north of us here yesterday, and at the very end, I went to that part of the website and I pulled it up after, after we'd, we'd been there for about four or five hours. And it, after we went through that section and I showed the students what they could expect and I told them, this is exactly what you're going to see as you're going through. One of the students came up to me afterwards and said, I'm not afraid of that exam now. And, and the nice thing about it is, I and I'm saying this as a program director, is that the registry has done an outstanding job of providing resources mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. We just have to avail ourselves of them. They're right. there. They're free. All it's going to cost us as educators, and we're all busy, is a little bit of time to go in and research those and see how we implement those. What I think, one thing I think, my... Th- in my mind, when I look across the nation and I interface with people across the country, doing, either doing site visits or my previous role at NMC and different things like that and talking to different educators, I think the the impact that we're going to see more so that's going to impact pass rates or impact the ability to get students to be successful clinicians is this push to cook them out faster and cheaper. And I call it fast, cheap, and dirty, right? Mm-hmm. I, I just can't make a paramedic in six months, guys. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I know, I'm, I know I've got some chiefs. I love them. They're great guys. And I know you did paramedic school back in 1983. And I know that it only cost you 386 hours of time. But you weren't even taught 12 weeks capnography. Mm-hmm. You, were, you, know, you basically were taught that you had to call to start an IV, you know, and you literally learned shock, 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 everybody shock, little shock, little shock, big shock, big shock. And you, you don't even know what Bertillion is, right? And, and that's not what we're doing now. No, and so no. the, 
in any way, sometimes I think our job as educators is to also get out and let our employers and our consumers and our students know that this is going to take a little more than you thought. You yeah. know, and, there's and, so much to this that you have to be have and you got to be able to get in here so that you can equip yourself to be successful. Agreed. And and when it comes to that website where you get to experience 15 AMT, 15 paramedic items, I hear uh, educators say, I would love to do research by examination, right? but I'm scared of it. And I'm like, so, well, here's the no risk way to do no it. experience. Yeah, there is but no even risk. if you, even yeah. if you fail it, who has to know? No. Yeah, right. You just At go least you've test. exposed yourself yeah. to what your right. students are having. And remember, we're through. looking for minimal entry yeah. level competency. competency. We're not looking for mastery. So I think there's always that fear, though, from an educator. What if I fail it? Well, no one will know. No one will know. You're not going to get a call from Bill Seifert, the band's coming at two. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. So, gentlemen, thank you for uh, for taking time to talk briefly about clinical That's judgment, right. its importance. It's it's clearly not as scary as some people think it is. Really. It's no, uh, so, the new no. exam is going to ha have uh, an opportunity for for individuals to be tested on it, um, consistent with what's going on in the field. So, um, I know at the National Registry, we're excited about it. Um, happy to hear from your perspectives, education, um, educational views as far as what some tidbits, some secret sauces for making sure your students are prepared. But thank you for joining me today thank you. Uh, for this Appreciate conversation. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you wouldn't mind, please click the like and subscribe buttons, as well as the notifications so you can get notifications of upcoming episodes. Also, for the latest and greatest happenings of the National Registry, feel free to go to nrmt.org. Thank you very much. And again, stay safe.